this webinar about uh, the environmental impact and assessment and strategic decision, uh, which is uh, based on an uh, European project. The name of the project is the FACABE RLO. And uh, what we want today is that we explore, uh, okay, what happens with this type of uh, uh, developments that are related now to the circularity and the environmental impact of the materials that we have in the facade, and then which could be the best way that facade companies, uh, industrial companies related to the facade, uh, architects and other uh, uh, engineers and other companies uh, related to the facade construction and architecture can do or can improve in order to have a better environmental impact. So, as uh, as you know, uh, uh, because we have this uh, program in the in the web page, uh, okay, we are going to have now uh, two hours and a half uh, of uh, presentations and also discussion in order to okay explain you uh, a little uh, what. Uh, the companies and the universities involved in this event uh, can't uh, uh, have been done in this in this topic. As you know, because uh, uh, of my language, the language that I'm using, okay, the webinar is going to be in English. It could happen that if you have some questions and you want to make in Spanish, we can we can translate. Uh, uh, but uh, initially, because of the uh, presenters are mainly outside of Spain. Um, uh, at the end, the, the language that we are going to use is in English. So, you can see the, the program that we have. So, uh, we are going to start with a little presentation about uh, this webinar, this introduction that I, I am making. Then I will give the word to Pablo Martin from ACFABE that have, uh, uh, has helped us uh, to organize this event and he's going to participate and give uh, his thoughts about uh, what means this type of uh, uh, developments related to, to the facade. And then uh, after that, uh, we will uh, go to the presentation of the webinar itself. The first one is going to be done by Juan Nazcarate from the University of Delft. That uh, He's going to talk a little about the project where all this development is based. And also he's going to talk about the design and engineering of circular products and the business models and value chain for a circular facade industry. We have changed a little the configuration of the webinar. Now we are going to have at the beginning the presentations and later uh, after the presentation, we will have the workshop where uh, we have, uh, you will be able to participate, to comment and contribute with your uh, ideas in order to improve this, uh, the possibilities that we have related to circularity. So after the presentation of Juan, what we will talk is about the environmental performance and unique selling point in the facade uh, industry. Uh, his, this presentation is going to be done by Linda Hildebrand and Kintran from Aachen uh, University. And then uh, to finish the part of the presentations, uh, we will have a presentation related to applying the, the life cycle analysis of the facades in a broader context of the uh, context of buildings, survive mining, etc by uh, Esther van der Boet uh, and Theon uh, Berhaven from the Leiden University. Uh, so they will make this, this presentation. We will have a little break uh, at uh, uh, 10 to 11 of 10 minutes. And then uh, at 11, what we will do is to start with an interactive workshop. Uh, we will use the tool uh, MyRoboard. I'm going to explain you a little now uh, how this works. And after uh, this session, that is going to last only 50 minutes, uh, we will have uh, some conclusions and uh, about what you have uh, uh, perceived of this session. You will receive an email uh, with some questions in order to improve uh, future webinars and know in a better way your opinion. And also take into account that this uh, uh, webinar is uh, the first, uh, um, the first uh, uh, conference of uh, a two uh, conference that we are going to have uh, about this topic. The second one is going to be in a, a trade fair, the MIS, that is going to be in November, and uh, that uh, that conference will be uh, in person uh, in, in Madrid. 
later I will explain you a little more about this conference. And uh, okay, as we are going to have a lot of more time in that conference, uh, uh, take this part of the webinar as an introduction uh, to see the possibilities that we have in this topic. And later in this conference is what, what we are going to be able to work in a specific topics, also to use what uh, you have in your companies as examples. And with this, okay, I think that, uh, okay, this is not uh, uh, a lot of time, but we can give you some uh, interesting ideas of how to use or how to improve the way uh, the facades are, uh, uh, are included in the market, in the buildings and the possibilities that we have at this moment and that we need to be requested by the governments and the public authorities in the future. So uh, some uh, useful information. So uh, you, I think that you have uh, a chat uh, or a chat uh, um, uh, section uh, once you enter in the, in the conference. Also, you have a question section, so uh, please, it, during the, the conference, uh, during the presentation of my colleagues, do you have any question? Please put in the chat and then after the presentations, uh, we will try to answer uh, and also include this information as a starting point in the, uh, in the workshop, workshop itself. Also, uh, if you raise your hand once we finish uh, the presentation, okay, we can give you the work in order to make some uh, question uh, by by voice, but taking into account that we are not going to have a lot of time for questions in that part. It's going to be more open and more flexible, the part of the webinar, and then we have uh, like an hour uh, in order to, okay, make some cross conversation between us uh, and answer all your questions. So to uh, use this uh, Miro board that is going to be, uh, that will allow you to uh, Put ideas in this in this board, and also to perhaps answer some of the questions that uh, we are going to put there. Uh, if you look of your chat, uh, uh, I'm putting. I'm going to put now a link, uh, and uh, with this link, uh, you will be able to go uh, to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, to this, uh, sorry, to this. Uh, uh, to this uh, to this board if you enter in the link uh, you only be able will be able to see what uh, the others are doing if you create an account that is a three steps uh, process very very fast uh, you also can contribute so please try to do it i send this information on wednesday to some of the uh, to all of the attendants but as i know that there are new attendants uh, please try to do it in this way uh, in order to uh, uh, okay uh, advance in this in this part, and now I'm going to give the word to uh, my colleague Pablo Martin from Acefave, the director of Acefave, the Spanish Association of uh, Manufacturers of Facades and Windows, and he's going to give you a little introduction about the purpose of this webinar. So, uh, uh, Pablo, whenever you want. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Welcome to everybody. Good morning. And let's remember the purpose of, of this webinar. Firstly, to inform the actors involved in facet industry of the possibilities and implications of processes related to circularity and sustainability. To highlight that circularity in the facet industry involves the training of professionals on retroactive processing of legacy equipment and construction materials and the redesign of future components, business models, and supply chains. And last, to share information produced in Facet Reload Project, funded under the EIT raw materials about cases, to map in which building components the metal materials can be found and determine their value hierarchy for economically effective recovery methodologies, including supply chain and business models to advise companies on how to optimize their remanufacturing processes and extend the service lives of their products, and information workshops with companies and experts to exchange knowledge and sketch best practices for manufacturers' products. Also, I want to highlight the opportunity of this webinar uh, 
there is no need to tell you about the uh, situation we are now living in with the shortage on raw materials, with delays on the supply chain and the deliveries of final products. So we are now in a special moment. The existing facades are now the minority of this century. That's the importance of the, of the, and, uh, and the opportunity of this webinar to focus on, on these issues. And finally, I hope to meet you, all of you, in, in the MIS conference in a few weeks in Madrid, in FEMA, and we can share our points of view and our uh, vision of, of the moment we are now dealing. That's all for my part. Thank you. And I wish that you have a, a, a good webinar and profit with all the conference and the and the opponents that we are going to to listen. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Pablo. Um, so uh, now uh, what we are going to do is to start with the webinar itself uh, with the presentations. I'm going to give the uh, word to our colleague uh, Juan Azcarate. Juan Azcarate uh, is working on the Delft University and uh, uh, he is going to start with the uh, presentation of the uh, of the first session that, that we have of this webinar. So Juan, uh, whenever you want, you can uh, you can start. Now, uh, can you talk now? Thanks. Okay. Yeah, now I can talk. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for the for the introduction. I had a bit of a glitch with the network just before uh, I had to start speaking. Of course, that always has to uh, happen. Um, but well, welcome everyone. I will just give you a brief introduction of um, well the project. What are the main objectives of the project, and also what are some of the other topics involved in this um, well in this whole course, uh, which we will not be looking at today, but which uh, will be presented during the. Well, extended version of the of the workshop in Madrid uh, next month. So, well, as I as, as we mentioned before, facade relog is a course uh, aimed at uh, industry uh, practice, uh, practitioners um, looking at the reverse logistics for the recovery of metals in the facade industry. And we're talking, of course, about uh, mainly aluminium, steel, and all kinds of alloys and uh, other materials which are um, used in the facade industry. Um, what is facade uh, reverse logistics? Uh, well, basically, reverse logistics is a process for recovering the value that is embedded in products and uh, process and materials. So, of course, we have forward logistics, which is about extraction of raw materials, uh, fabrication of parts, creation of sub-assemblies, uh, and then part assemblies, and then distribution to the customer or to the construction site where these assemblies will be placed into a building and will be used, of course, for, uh, for decades. Um, on the other hand, we, we have the option of recovering this value uh, by maximizing um, the favoring of uh, reuse, repair, and remanufacturing activities. So basically, how can you reuse some of the components as they are or repair them in order to bring them back to a useful uh, extended service life, let's say. Remanufacturing, which is uh, well replacing key components and parts of these products so that they can be given a second life and well recycling which we are all familiar with which is just breaking these products down into their uh, essential components and then using these materials these secondary materials to uh, create a new generation of products but of course when you recycle something you destroy most of the value that is embedded in the material and therefore it's not um, well the most optimum um, option and all this chain of reuse repair remanufacture and recycle is what we refer to as reverse uh, logistics um, what, what does it mean for us in the facade industry? Well, the steps in the reverse logistics process uh, can be broken down into four simple steps, let's say. Uh, the deconstruction of these components uh, from the building, the collection of all these uh, components that we have removed from the building into sort of uh, pre-selected groups of uh, like materials and like products, which can be processed uh, together in a single factory. Inspection and sorting of this to well to check for um, 
for quality, for wear and tear after they have been on a building for many uh, decades um, and was sorting into what is the best uh, way that they can be used while uh, retaining most of the value uh, possible in these components and trying to redo or, um, or replace as little as possible. And then last of all, the re-life option, uh, which basically means uh, well, whether we're going to remanufacture it by replacing components, whether we're going to just repair certain components and then put it back into the market, or whether we can just simply reuse the component as it is, maybe for the same function, maybe for a slightly different function with, uh, with fewer technical requirements. Um, of course, when you establish a reverse logistics chain, um, it can provide a lot of internal and external value for your company or for the supply network uh, that you'll be working with to perform these activities. Uh, and we see numerous opportunities, such as, for example, cost saving, uh, building a better reputation as a sort of a green, sustainable company, generating new sources of revenue, producing less uh, pollution, and therefore less impact in the, on the environment. And of course, uh, the, well, the res responsibility everyone has to society and to the planet uh, in doing the right thing. Um, on the other hand, of course, there are many uh, significant organizational and technical barriers that have to be um, overcome. These are also uh, particularly uh, well, difficult or complex in the case of the construction sector, because there's not so much of a top-down integration like we see, for example, in the automotive section or in aerospace. And we also have to deal with very long timescales. So again, in automotive, maybe you get the materials back within a decade or two. In construction, it can take 30, 50, or 100 years to get your materials back. Um, and of course, there are barriers which are just general. So for example, the lack of proper design, the lack of facilities to uh, collect and uh, remanufacture these components, uh, very tight scheduling uh, when you are well, working on a project and delivering the project. Um, it's difficult to life cycle buildings. There's no standards or, or very few standards and policies to allow us or to help us in this transition. Um, and well, there's already a, a lot of effort and uh, well, knowledge exchange and communication between stakeholders. And this is made even more complicated when you're trying to not only deliver the product uh, and the project up front, but also have to plan for 30 or 50 years of operation and how to get the materials back. So the Facade Relog project aims to um, help companies in this transition by uh, answering some practical questions uh, in a number of different fields. So for ex example, how can value be extracted from both newly designed and uh, legacy facade products? And this means products that are already uh, placed on buildings and have been there for decades. Um, which new technologies or processes or applications are needed to enable uh, reverse logistics? Uh, what kind of roles must uh, exist, which might not exist yet? And what kind of new stakeholders uh, need to be created? Uh, to allow for a circular facade industry? What kind of information and knowledge are we missing in this uh, process? Um, which drivers and barriers also allow companies to start thinking about this and which kind of challenges they have to overcome? And well, of course, where do we start? What are the first uh, steps that must be uh, taken? And to allow this, the program is uh, basically made up of three thematic workshops. Um, the first one was on circular building products. It was last uh, year in 2020. Uh, earlier this year, we had one on business and supply chain models. Uh, today, we are in the third one, which is on life cycle cost analysis and evaluation and strategic decision making from the environmental perspective. And then um, next uh, month, you will receive the full invitation. But next month, we will have one single workshop in which we will look at all three topics combined uh, in Madrid uh, live. Um, a brief introduction to EIT raw materials, which is the, uh, the EU funded uh, body that is uh, sponsoring this uh, project. Basically, they are they were created with the idea of highlighting well, why are raw materials important for society and specifically for the European society. Um, the reason why they're important, of course, as many of us know, is that the consumption has been just increasing exponentially of, this, um, of these materials, not only in quantity, but also in diversity. So we see how the technologies of today just use a, a vastly uh, broader diversity of materials in their day-to-day -day process. Uh, and buildings are by no, uh, by no means um, an exception. We also see how in our buildings, the more technologies we have, the more uh, energy efficient we want to make them and the more we want them to generate and use their own uh, energy. 
the more we have to um, embed all kinds of different products and all kinds of different materials and uh, basic elements into our houses. And of course, the more we, we use, the more important it becomes that we manage to recover them and reuse them somewhere else. Just to give a few examples, well, solar farms, of course, use uh, gallium. Wind farms use neodymium for the magnets. Uh, electric vehicles use uh, cobalt and other elements for uh, batteries and, uh, and other um, uh, vehicle systems. And well, the Internet of Things, of course, is also full of electrical equipment uh, that uses all kinds and diversities of uh, base elements, which should be recovered. Um, from the European perspective, it's particularly important because, uh, well, Europe doesn't really produce uh, many or most of these uh, elements. They're mostly imported from abroad. And this, of course, places Europe in a huge uh, well, geopolitical risk of not being able to acquire these elements in the future. So basically, the idea is whatever elements are already in Europe, because they're being used in our products and processes already, how can we recover them and make sure that we can well, rely on this for future uh, generations of products? Um, EIT uh, materials focus on a few themes, uh, for example, exploration and raw material resources, so more on the mining side, uh, mining in challenging environments, uh, increased resource efficiency in mineral and metallurgical processes, so how to make the extraction more uh, effective, recycling mat and material chain optimization for end-of-life products, substitution of critical and toxic materials, so replacing them with other kinds of elements, and the one that we are focusing on now, which is the design of products and services for the circular economy. So how can we uh, really bring this to the companies that are not on the mining side, but on the manufacturing and the service delivery side? And well, for more information, you can always uh, look at the EIT raw material website. Um, now, normally here we will have a change of uh, speaker. Uh, unfortunately, my professor and uh, colleague, Kim Klein, is um, on holidays this week. So uh, you will get to, uh, to listen to me for, uh, for a bit longer. Uh, I will just give you a very brief uh, overview of the three other topics which have been touched upon in this uh, course so far, as I mentioned last year and earlier this year. The first one is circular building products. Uh, of course, many of you know the impact of the building construction sector, 40% uh, of primary energy use worldwide, 26% of material resource use and 35% of waste generation. Uh, so of course we are uh, well part of a hugely uh, relevant uh, sector from the sustainability perspective. Um, and well, what, what is it uh, to think about circular facades? So basically we're all used to this uh, linear process of well, acquiring resources, uh, manufacturing them into products, and then uh, through facade design and engineering, applying these uh, products through the construction uh, phase onto our buildings. Mm -hmm. What we're looking at now is how to use and manage these products effectively, how they can be recovered at the end of the service life, uh, either through recycling or through other activities, and how to minimize this uh, waste stream uh, that you see at the bottom to be as little as possible. Um, the focus of this course is on the closing uh, loops, arrows, so that means recycling, remanufacturing and uh, reuse. Um, and of course, this is a way of uh, when minimizing the loss of embodied value and embodied uh, materials. Some examples that we uh, that we have been uh, working on within this uh, project, for example, it's a steel curtain wall for reuse, and you can see how well, it's, it's hard to see, but there, the connection we have a separation between the sort of structural part of the facade and the uh, finishing and water tightness part of the facade. So you can actually disconnect them and uh, separate the functional requirements that can remain on the facade from those that can be replaced every 20, 30 years, let's say. Another example is a uh, pretty plastic. It's a Dutch um, company that is being has has been re uh, recycling uh, plastics from all kinds of consumer uh, products uh, into this uh, tiling for uh, facade cladding. And then they take advantage, of course, of the fact that all these source uh, plastics are of different colors to then produce tiles which are completely uh, unique and diverse between them. Um, another example is uh, a, product, um, a project on design for disassembly of facade components. So basically timing how long it takes to break apart a product and how you can actually uh, well, re-engineer this product to make it easier to uh, disassemble and also to make it easier to replace certain key components within the facade. Um, and then from a more systemic perspective, we have this product, uh, project on facade leasing which is about how to basically create a whole new uh, network uh, or entirely new value chain 
in which you have the client, the facade provider, and the financier or the banks uh, will working together over a period of 30, 40, 50 years to provide a facade not only as a product that then has to be uh, maintained by the client, but as a sort of ongoing service for which the client just pays an ongoing uh, fee. Another one of the topics that we have looked at so far is of uh, business models for circular facade industry. This is a topic that uh, K.O. Lurven, also our partners, have been working on. Um, and where basically the question is why, why shift towards uh, circular uh, business models, which of course is a big question that many of you will probably have. Um, a few of the key um, aspects to, say, to take into account is of course cost reduction. So you have lower costs because of efficiency uh, improvements and because you can actually reuse your own materials. You have a value increase. Um, so you can differentiate between different customer segments, uh, the ones that have higher ambitions and higher sustainability goals, and the ones that basically want uh, well, just access to cheaper products. Um, you have a competitive advantage. So if you're providing an ongoing uh, service, for example, or if you are uh, the, the, the final owner of these uh, products, then you can lock in your consumers and lock out your competitors. And then you also keep a customer, um, well, you, you attract new consumers who maybe were not considering getting a new facade, but if you uh, propose to them a different kind of business model, then maybe they would be open to, uh, to considering such, a, such an improvement. Uh, from an environmental economic perspective, of course, we, uh, well, we know that landfilling uh, or just throwing away our products is not a, not a viable solution and, and not an attractive solution either. So you can see in this example how well, landfilling is by far the most uh, environmentally costly and the most economically costly. Downcycling and recycling uh, are much better, but then recycling through selective demolition, so that means breaking apart our buildings and trying to make the best use possible from our uh, components, is the most attractive, attractive, especially from the economic perspective, for the owner of the building or the owner of these components. Um, on the other hand, if we look at it from the perspective of the, uh, excuse me, of the recycling sector, um, it's very tricky for them to actually make a business case yet out of, um, well, either downcycling, recycling, or selective demolition. Uh, and the, the, the maths are just not really working out for them yet. Uh, the second-hand market for these materials and for these uh, products is not quite there, it's not developed enough. Uh, and of course, until we manage to develop the second-hand market and we'll find a way of reusing these components more effectively, it will be very hard uh, to well, create a recycling sector which is uh, well self-sustaining from a financial point of view. Uh, of course, from the perspective of uh, companies, we have to develop new capacities. So design for this maintainability, longevity, and standardization of uh, components so they can be broken apart more easily. We have to uh, train our staff to uh, have new skills, for example, this assembly of uh, components without destroying it. Uh, we have to learn how to maintain and repair uh, our products more effectively and keep our consumer informed all the time and use their feedback to, uh, to come up with better, uh, more effective maintenance plans. And of course, how we have to learn how, how to dismantle and uh, how to organize all these reverse logistics to be able to reuse all these components. Yeah. And of course, there's a big role uh, to be played in all this by building information modeling, digital twins, and the whole digitalization of the construction sector. Um, last of all, a few slides on reverse supply chains, which is another one of the topics that we have already looked at. Um, as I mentioned, reverse supply chains is, well, just the, the inverse of the normal supply chains we're used to, in which you try to recover all these materials that you have actually placed on the market before. Um, and it is with the flow of secondary, either used secondhand or end of life products, and how to, uh, well, how to recover the value in them. Um, the main differences concerning the structure of these logistic networks are, were, of course, the degree of centralization, how many locations do you have in which these activities are carried out, uh, how many levels do you have, uh, basically do you have different facilities in which the components are broken down into smaller and smaller components and smaller elements, um, how does this link with other networks or other sectors, uh, do you keep a very closed um, sort of reverse logistic uh, facility in which you only focus on products of your own company, for example, or do you try to uh, well, find synergies with other companies in your value chain or even with other companies in other sectors to sort of um, well, make the, most, the, the process more effective? Uh, open versus closed loops. So, yeah, basically, um, 
do you have a one-way structure in the sense that flows enter at one point and leave at another, or do you have more, uh, well, more permeable processes in which you sort of extract value at different points? And the degree of branch cooperation. So the facade industry tends to have quite close collaboration between uh, members of the same branch. And this, for example, could be a good uh, opportunity for all actors in the facade sector to well invest in a single sort of reverse logistic chain through which they can recover their materials. Um, in terms of collection and transport, uh, well, integrating the libraries and collections, of course, is very important. Try to time your collection so you can just go and pick it everything up at the same time. Um, have these periodic schedules uh, based on monitoring the demand and also monitoring maybe calls for service from the occupier of the building to try to um, will come up with proactive maintenance uh, schedules um, and of course we're separating and routing of independent resources to different facilities and collection points. Um, building information modeling as I mentioned is incre incredibly important. Uh, it will help you identify what information you need and also will keep all that information about what's in your buildings uh, organized and uh, updated also as maintenance uh, happens as replacement of components happens you need to know what exactly is in your building at all times uh, so that when the time comes to replace it you can also try to recover as much of the value in it as possible um, and well just some of the conclusions from the previous workshops that i have been uh, describing uh, of course there's a, a huge uh, interest from industry uh, and, and several very large companies uh, that recognize that there's both market and regulation push towards this and this will eventually make the topic uh, crucial. Um, a number of stakeholders are missing and also capacities within companies both to uh, well, uh, manage this um, information and also to on the floor, on, on the factory floor and on the construction site, uh, recover these materials and bring them back to the, to the facilities. Um, and well, examples and case studies are very few, especially examples in the construction sector. So we will try to give a few examples of that today. Uh, and also we will try to learn from other sectors where these uh, lessons might be a bit more advanced. And last of all, I want to invite you during this session, uh, also because this um, course is an ongoing, uh, well, it's, an, it's a work in progress. So we're still working on, uh, on using your feedback to generate the next generation of uh, content. So today, please uh, think a lot about well, has the information that you have been seeing today uh, been useful? What kind of information are you missing in order to be able to take the next uh, step? And how can we help you? And we will be very happy to, uh, to address uh, these questions and to try to help you as much as possible moving uh, forward. That's it from my side and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Juan. Uh, I don't see uh, still in the chat any question. Uh, I think that uh, is a lot of information at this uh, at this moment. So as we have a little time uh, until 10, where we have the next presentation, I have one question. So uh, the first uh, uh, information that we have of using this reverse logistic doesn't imply that uh, the cost of manufacturing the facade and the entire process is going to be increased. Uh, so we can have an equilibrium here and, uh, okay, be, be better from the environmental and circular uh, point of view and also don't imply that the companies need to have higher cost. Yeah, so they actually, well, some of the examples from other sectors, for example, from printers or cars, actually show that there's a lower manufacturing cost. Uh, because, of course, if you can use your own uh, materials or even your own components, uh, for example, there are printers which are made 85, 90 percent out of pre, well, prefabricated components that have you just reclaimed from a previous generation, then, well, a huge part of your manufacturing costs are just, uh, well, taken out of the and you can basically sell almost the same product as new um, with much lower manufacturing costs because you are using a lot of your uh, cores is the, the the industry name these cores are these components of uh, for example your uh, aluminium profiles or your joints or other kinds of elements which you might be able to just clean remanufacture repair and then give a second life without having to invest uh, all the energy and all the costs um, up front so there is a bit of a transition time in which uh, of course costs will have to be made to develop this uh, reverse logistics uh, chain and collection points and so on but on the other hand, this should balance against just being able to produce the same kind of uh, quality of new products for a much lower cost. 
while also, of course, fulfilling all the social and environmental responsibilities that we have. Okay, and uh, second question. Uh, what, what do you think that uh, need to be uh, done the main effort? So uh, this is more a, term, a, a topic very related to the design. So we need to, we need to design the facades and the, this type of components in a different way in terms of connections or in terms of the, the design itself or uh, or at the end is something that more related to use another type of materials or another way of construction or something very connected to the digital twins that are beginning to appear everywhere and that you know all the information and once you need to dismantle the building at the end you have all the information and be able to okay work better yeah, I think it's I think it's a bit of both, and uh, there will be some uh, talk about it in the in the following sessions. On one side, it's about uh, engineering your components and your facades to be well to be easier to disassemble, as the example that I showed of this uh, steel facade that can be disconnected the structural part from the water tightness part. Uh, you can replace some uh, materials with materials which are easier to uh, to remanufacture or which are just uh, which have a lower environmental impact themselves. Um, but of course, a big part of it is, let's say, these are strategies for how to deal with future facades. A big part of the question is also how to deal with the facades that are already that are already there. And then for that, the question is more of uh, processes for recovering these uh, facade elements, especially how to recognize, uh, well, for, for whom does this have the value? And how do you actually recover this value? At the moment, there's just basically no, no actor that is uh, interested in recovering this value. Not the building owner, not the facade builders. Uh, as I showed, for recycling companies and uh, demolition companies, it's very hard to make a business case. Um, so I, I believe a lot of it has to do with the economy of scale, basically. The more you uh, integrate more of your value chain and your, and your supply chain, the bigger the volumes of facades you will be dealing with, of course. And then the bigger your uh, economy of scale, the more likely that is, it is that you can actually make a business case for recovering all this uh, legacy equipment or all this equipment that is already on buildings. Okay, last question uh, uh, is uh, regulation. Do you think that, uh, okay, we are now... Uh, some directives that at the European level that are requiring this type of things. So do you think that, uh, okay, at the end, the, the regulations are going to be harder in the next year? So at the end, all the companies need to have uh, defined a process like this, because if not, they, are, they could have problems uh, of uh, including their products in the market. Yeah, definitely. That would be a huge, um, a huge uh, driver for the for the change. Already in the Netherlands, uh, for example, the government has a, a very, um, a very important uh, yeah, policy push towards a circular economy, towards recovering materials, towards um, eventually. Uh, we're we're expecting that in a few years, maybe when you build a new building, you you have the responsibility or the obligation to reach a certain quota of uh, the percentage of your building that has to be made out of second, uh, secondary materials or secondary components. Um, so components that you have brought from other, uh, from other buildings and remanufactured or reprocessed. Um, at the moment, I think the, the, one of the problems is that there's a lot of uh, debate ongoing about how these regulations should uh, work. Uh, probably, well, the, the COVID um, situation didn't really help it because, of course, it, the Policymakers don't want to add even more pressure to companies at the moment, but we definitely uh, think that it's something that is coming soon. And a lot of companies that we speak to also in the Scandinavian or Northwestern European context, they are already seeing the effects of this kind of uh, policy push towards having to recover your materials and having to have this uh, extended producing responsibility for the products that you put on the market. You cannot just place them on the market and then make it the client's problem anymore. You have to actually have a plan uh, for how to recover them and already have some kind of uh, yeah, pre predefined uh, tax or predefined savings fund uh, made for eventually paying the costs of recovering these materials and giving a secondary, a second life to them. Okay, thank you. Now we are on time. In fact, we have a, a, we are one minute late, so I am going to give the word to Linda. Uh, 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 so, Linda, uh, whenever you want, uh, you can start with your presentation. Thank you, Juan, uh, uh, Juan uh, for your interesting presentation. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Um, I think you can see my screen, or can you? Yeah? Yes, uh, we can see Linda. Okay. Uh, I unfortunately cannot now. So, good morning. Now I'm with you. Thank you, my name is Linda Hildebrandt. I'm from Aachen University, where I hold a chair for reuse in architecture, and I'm very happy to um, yeah, speak to speak to the facade industry um, today because I believe that the facade industry has a really um, yeah key role for transforming the built environment in in the direction of circularity and. Um, what we see today is that the topic of circularity and carbon neut uh, neutrality is very, very popular and um, also people outside the building sector um, users are more and more interested in this, um, in this topic and we see that um, in competitions um, the designer and the, or the, the building design needs to um, yeah, needs to provide concepts for circularity and um, provide not only a very nice building with um, high quality architecture, but also to claim that the uh, embodied you know, or the environmental qualities um, perform very, very well. And this is um, very interesting when we when we look at it. We all we already um, have a history in this um, topic. You all know about um, energy efficiency and that we. Um, yeah, came a long way in reducing it. Um, Germany is especially um, well strict uh, in this, but also successful. So they, um, we have a lot of regulations um, that um, yeah define the amount of not renewable energy that we are um, allowed to use, and we are going for um, zero. We are going for um, well the the uh, zero energy buildings. And what we see, um, or this, this tendency makes one thing very clear. Once we control the amount of energy that we use to operate the building, the building substance, so the building material, the building construction is the parameter where we can define the environmental extent of the building. And um, so this part, um, the, the materials, the type of construction, uh, grow in relevance. And this is um, something that is uh, very interesting from an from architectural um, perspective and also then related um, to the products that we use for it. Um, we have this big topic of um, energy efficiency and now we learn that we um, have another parameter, the materials that need to be taken into consideration. And uh, in the last couple of years, I would say maybe the last 10 years, we have um, the material evaluation, the life cycle assessment, um, in which we can um, learn about the extent of environmental impact that is related to materials um, and yeah, are able to do a holistic assessment, not only the operational energy, but also the energy that is linked um, to, the, to the materials. And, when I was doing my uh, PhD, um, the, the people said, okay, we're not uh, talking about energy efficiency anymore. We're now talking about resource efficiency or emission efficiency. And now the, um, the, the debate is a little bit uh, changing. We, we have a limit in this uh, efficiency um, debate. We not only want to reduce things, but we want to approach it in a circular way in order to um, yeah, make the best out uh, of the materials like one already outlined um, in, a, in his presentation. And um, we already see some successful uh, projects and when we, when we look at it, uh, what makes these projects successful? Um, we have one, most, uh, most of the times it's the client um, who starts with the first um, yeah with the first step that he sets um, the requirements for his project so for instance in the Hafen city in in Hamburg we have uh, a client that says um, um, the, the environmental performance of our building is very relevant so um, yeah in this case the buildings um, should have um, yeah they uh, 
it could either be a climate neutrality or it could be a circularity uh, goal. So um, we need to have a starting point where the client is willing to um, to invest uh, in this uh, in this topic and um, also um, form the identity of the building with an environmental character. And then we have the designers, um, the architects who specify it. So, okay, what does this carbon neutrality really mean? Um, uh, what are the specific goals? What can we do? And what is the, the goal for this um, uh, project? This is relevant to communicate it in the end. And then we have the engineers who have to make everything thing work then in the end. And then, uh, of course, the industry um, who needs to provide um, uh, products for this high goal, and um, this is uh, a key role in my um, in my perspective. Um, that we uh, that the um, industry now here has the the potential to really um, uh, make an, make a difference there. having troubles with the with the um, software sorry so um, in order to uh, to provide to, to provide um, a product uh, from uh, from industry and specifically the facade industry we not only have to provide excellent quality this could be physical um, aesthetical but we also have to um, consider the environmental performance of it. And I believe that there is a, a big opportunity um, for the facade industry to, um, yeah, um, as like, uh, like I used the word here, the unique, unique selling point. I believe that the, the industry partners, which are recognizing the potential today, have a big advantage. So it is relevant um, to also communicate the emissions that are related um, to the product and the resources. Is it primary or is it secondary material? Has the, has the material been used or is it primary? And also how long um, the building, uh, the material can be used in the building context and what kind of post-use scenarios um, are linked to it. And um, in order to make it uh, clear, we um, we have a small material library and these are the categories that we're using for it and we find them very helpful. Um, we have this very scientific um, approach to it where you can calculate the numbers and this is what we also need um, in the, yeah, in the de design and engineering uh, process. But in an early design stage and also throughout the, the project, uh, when you talk to people who are not so much in the topic, it is helpful to come up with very hands-on um, hands um, categories. And what we work with is um, reusable, so a material that can be used as it is, um, material from recycling, so it has a secondary um, share of um, material in the product, it is recyclable in the future or it is um, renewable. And um, I already um, mentioned the word life cycle assessment, um, that is the method to calculate uh, environmental impact to products or processes. Um, by calculating uh, the flows, so all the materials that are used, um, all the emissions that are linked to the production, um, in our case of a, maybe uh, of a glass a glass sheet, are uh, calculated, um, and it is, yeah, the life cycle assessment is regulated by some standards which give a very yeah they provide a framework of the calculation um, type and in order to uh, quantify the environmental impact is very useful and powerful um, method and i want to highlight um the the first um the, the first phases uh, in life cycle assessment so uh, we have 17 phases which are defined by norm and um, the first three are the most important one because here the environmental impact um, takes, yeah, is, uh, most of the times is 
the or is the majority one, the major one. And I want to zoom in into these uh, first uh, three uh, phases, which is the resource extraction, the transport, and the fabrication in factory. And when we look at this graph, this is um, a small study that I uh, did on glass sheets. We see that um, for the resource extraction, we need some energy. We need a little bit for transport, but the fab fabrication in factory is the, um, yeah, is the biggest part, which um, tells us that it is very, very important what, source, uh, what energy source we use in our, uh, in our factory when we have a renewable energy source in the factory, we can drastically reduce the environmental impact of our production. And this is the key information um, to the facade industry. And also the typology of facades is very um, relevant and um, makes us, or can give us an, an um, idea of where we will end with a, with a, choice, with a, a choice of facade. So we have here um, um, a chart showing us on the x-axis the weight of the material. So we see on the y-axis um, uh, the embodied energy and the, the lighter uh, facades are then uh, oriented uh, in the center uh, of the, or on the left corner of the chart. So the uh, post and beam, um, construction with a single uh, layer, not a glass sheet uh, uh, layer, but um, just a, um, in contrast to the double uh, skin facades, um, they are light and they also account for um, low uh, embodied energy. Then we have the double facades, which account for the highest um, amount of embodied uh, energy and then we have the solid facades which are sort of um, in the middle. So these are 50 facades that I evaluated and you see that you can form a sort of group and this is a uh, very um, interesting um, yeah well interesting uh, basis for uh, to make a decision what kind of facade we're going for. for. So uh, already in the decision for a typology we have a certain um, affinity for the amount of um, uh, embodied energy. And the, the background for this, um, for this data uh, can be found uh, in several data. In um, the German-speaking countries, we have a free database which provides us with information for life cycle um, assessment. So we have a um, a platform where we can access material, um, um, yeah, different building materials per kilogram or per one cubic meter, and then for our specific um, uh, specific purpose, we can make a yeah easy calculation based on that. These are our average uh, values, and um, if you continue. Um, uh, if you go further in the, in the project process and you already know what kind of uh, products you have, you can work with the EPDs, the Environmental Product Declarations, um, where, you, um, uh, where you can access the uh, information for a specific product. And I have here, um, um, this is um, a slide um, that I, uh, that I um, made for, um, Acceleron Metal, the um, big um, metal um, company, and they have a 13, uh, they have 19 uh, EPDs which um, engineers and architects can use in order to make a calculation for their entire, um, entire building. And um, when, we, when we think about, so we, we have this big topic of um, reducing the um, energy, oh, sorry, um, replacing the energy source uh, to renewable and um, th th this as an, a mean to reduce the environmental impact of the of the facade. This is one way to really make a, make a difference. The second um, big or uh, very successful, um, very powerful way of reducing the environmental impact in facades is to use secondary material. 
So as we heard in the, in the first uh, contribution today, the environmental performance, uh, especially in facades, um, can be significantly uh, reduced with recycled um, content. And um, this is due to uh, the this is due to um, the the saved energy um, because you don't have to uh, you don't have to construct a, a new a new product of course. So um, what we um, we were in our institute looking into a secondary um, materials and we see a lot of uh, advantages. Um, um, in the in the use of secondary material, um, the reduction, the reduce uh, re reduction of primary resources, uh, the uh, reduced uh, landfill um, area. Sometimes we have to um, see where the functionality uh, differs. And um, when we talk to partners from industry, they say, "Well, we have to change the process, and this is complicated for us." Yes, that's true. In order to work with secondary materials, you um, you need to be um, yeah you need to adapt um, to this to to this new stream of materials. Um, especially for facade, the recycling share is very um, high, and what we see is that um, we have already competitors in the market that use 80% recycled content and. They result in 17 percent, uh, sorry, 75 percent reduced um, carbon emissions. So only 25 percent of the original primary content, which is such a game changer um, for the environmental performance of uh, metal facades, especially aluminum um, facades. So while we um, had the discussion a couple of years ago, I, I had a um, conference contribution in Athens and uh, somebody from the um, aluminum, I was talking about life cycle assessment and how high the values are for aluminum. Um, and somebody from the aluminum industry approached me uh, and said, well, uh, I don't wanna go into this method. I don't need it um, because aluminum performs so bad. Um, this is a way out. This is how we can, um, yeah, be uh, or integrate the uh, aluminum materials in a very, um, yeah, in a very environmental friendly way. Um, and in in order to um, um, keep the aluminum in the the cycle, not only recyclability but also reuse is um, is a path that should be should be integrated and um, right now we are only at the start of this um, yeah in re or we are at the start in reusing building components but we see um, a couple of advantages um, here um, in order to make this happen the the building or the the components have to have a certain have to have to have certain features and prefabrication and serial production is one. So if we have, um, yeah, repetitive uh, repetitive uh, details, not too complex in um, yeah, in the details in the construction, this helps in order to uh, to provide for reuse. Information is a big uh, topic here. Um, we need to know the type of um, connection. And also, it makes a lot of sense if we work with um, large formats. Um, so if we have um, a very detailed building like we see in the brick building on the uh, bottom, it is hard to uh, reuse it here because we have very small components that are detached in a way which are difficult to deconstruct. It's not impossible, but the effort is very high um, to do that. Um, and for uh, for uh, reused materials and also for uh, products with re re recycled um, content, we need to know where these sources for secondary material are and um, the information systems are growing. We have in the Netherlands the harvest map and we have comparable formats also in, uh, in Germany. 
we also need to work together with our recycling and um, yeah, a processing industry in order to make sure that we um, yeah, have high quality, uh, especially for, for recycled content. Um, when we talk about recyclability, it is uh, useful to uh, make the differentiation between pre- and post-consumer. We have a lot of pre-consumer recycling, um, which is the, is the recycled content that never leaves the factory. So when we cut the profiles, we have some leftover parts. And usually what everybody does is to collect these edges and um, um, process them further so they can become, um, again, a profile. This is pre-consumer um, recycling and post-consumer is when it is when it was part part of the building and while we are very good or the industry is very good in pre-consumer recycling we need to look at post-consumer recycling because there's a, um, a huge potential and for that we need to know type of materials the joints the processing and the technical properties and of course the market value um, we have a good um, disposition for uh, aluminum um, here and um, yeah, we need to make the circles uh, smaller and exploit exploit this potential. My last um, slide, um, I found it uh, super interesting. Um, we have um, we, we worked with uh, we worked with an um, engineering office on a um, on a project uh, in Australia, and um, the. Um, the question or the, the target was to have a um, um, climate neutral, CO2 neutral uh, building and also including the facade, including the entire building structure. So they designed an aluminum uh, glass uh, facade uh, post and beam construction and had a big problem because they, the timber structure of the building of the, the building was very good, but the facade um, yeah, contributed in a negative in a bad way. So what they um, what they did is they looked for a product um, which uh, which they found in the end, uh, which uh, worked with a secondary material um, like I said before, this 80% secondary material. Plus um, they have a renewable energy source on site for the production. So they could reduce the performance, environmental performance of the billets, essentially. And um, it was a big uh, competition um, because the, the company who was producing these um, low embodied carbon billets was only allowed to sell it to a certain party. And so they, it was a, a really um, high effort um, management in order to get these billets uh, to Australia and, and they were successful. And I, I find that super interesting because the, the company who produced these um, billets with a low embodied car carbon in the end had a unique selling point and in the end won the competition. And uh, I want to give that as a motivation um, uh, to the partners from the facade industry. And I'm very, very uh, curious on your comments and experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, we are a little delayed, but we have a question that I missed uh, in the in the previous in the previous session. But I think that is interesting also for this topic. So, the question made by uh, Sergi Castelli is how the performance of the new facade will be affected. There is a, any exercise done with a, re, a reused facade. Or the key point is to recycle the facade to a new element. So, do we have some information of the if the performance is affected uh, once we start with this type of processes? Um, well, what the um, what the partners from industry tell us is that um, in when we talk about aluminum facades, the performance is. Uh, absolutely comparable. We have um, sometimes if we we can have the scenario that we have a specific coating that leads to uh, uh, difficulties or challenges in the recycling process, but it is very, very, very rare. So um, uh, the the answer is we the performance is the same. So the 
the, in the um, example that I told you about this project in Australia, they could use, they did not have any, um, they did not have to do any adaptations. It, was, um, uh, um, it could be used in the same way in this project. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, as now we are five minutes late, uh, I'm going to thank you, Linda, for the interesting presentation. And I, I'm going to give the word to Esther van der Boet. Uh, and uh, she will talk about how we apply this life cycle analysis uh, of the facade to a broader context. So, uh, Esther, uh, whenever you want, uh, you can start with your presentation. Right now, uh, because I think that I need to unmute. Now you are unmuted, Esther. We hear you. Now I'm unmuted. Okay. So okay. I'm visible and also audible. Then I'm going to share my screen. So do you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Then I'm going to make this one small. I go back to the screen and to the first page. Okay. Um, uh, thanks very much. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll continue the topic. My name is Esther van der Voet. I'm um, uh, from Leiden University, from uh, the Institute of Environmental Sciences. Um, um, from the industrial ecology uh, department. Uh, what I will do is, is um, sort of um, start from, from a somewhat higher scale level. Life cycle assessment is, is pretty much um, a tool that, that can be used at the micro level of individual products and can be used to, to identify hotspots and to identify possibilities to improve the environmental performance of a specific product. But um, yeah, um, those um, materials have also another uh, starting point, and that, that's also relevant for the industry, the higher scale level. Um, we have seen in the previous presentation by Linda that materials play an increasingly important part in the environmental impacts related to buildings. Uh, as the energy performance in the use phase of the buildings improves, you see that that uh, resource extraction and the production of the construction uh, materials uh, becomes more important. Um, so I'm going into a little more detail about those uh, materials. Uh, and I'll talk about, well, what, what is the relevance of, of the materials in the built environment at global level. Uh, and then also uh, say something about, well, what can we expect for the future? What are the trends that, that uh, uh, we have to, to keep in mind? Um, so this picture comes out of the global resource outlook. Um, the uh, report published by the International Resource Panel of the United Nations that looks into, uh, well, how has resource extraction developed over time? Um, you can see that from 1970 to uh, around now, it has grown enormously. It has um, about uh, tripled. Um, you can also see that the non-metallic minerals uh, of which the construction minerals form by far the largest part, they have the largest share. Um, uh, relatively, um, it has even grown since 1970. And together with metals, which is the, the, the red part of the graph, it's now over 50%. Metals and minerals together, well, by far the largest uh, application of those is the construction of buildings and infrastructure. Um, now, if you look at the um, environmental uh, impacts of those resources, just the impact related to producing them, then you see that metals um, 
which is uh, the orange part of the graph, uh, are even more important. And that is because their um, greenhouse gas intensity, this is uh, just about uh, climate impact, so CO2 emissions, the, the uh, CO2 intensity uh, for metals is relatively very high. Um, and that's because they are energy intensive materials, much more so than the construction minerals. Um, there's other impacts also related to um, uh, metal and mineral production. It's not just CO2 emissions, but it's also um, um, ecotoxicity, human toxicity, human health that are important. And you see here the contribution of um, uh, metals and minerals. Um, and on the right hand side, you see uh, it broken down for a number of different metals. And then um, uh, iron and steel are, are in amounts obviously dominating, but uh, in impacts, not always. Um, and that's because steel produce, uh, steel production is, is less energy intensive than, for example, aluminium production. Now, looking into the future, there are a number of trends that are relevant. Trend one is that the production increase that we saw in the past is expected to continue. And this is um, for several reasons. One is um, the population grows, um, more people means more resources and also more metals. Uh, two is the growth, the expected growth in welfare. That means that the amount of materials per person increases, driving uh, demand up further. And then there is the uh, energy transition. So the fact that, that we will move towards um, a renewable energy system, that means that, that uh, we need more metals. So that those are three, um, well, very powerful trends that drive the production further up. So there is as yet no sign of slowing down of the increase in production. And of course, if production increases, the impacts that go with it also increase. The second uh, trend that is important for metals um, is related to ore grades. We see over time a process of ore grade decline, which means that, that the average concentration of metals in the ores that are actually processed um, uh, is going down. The picture here is for copper. You see that it went down from, well, 14% uh, percent of copper in the ore in, in about 1800 to um, 0.5 uh, now, and the trend is even uh, further down. This ore grade development um, is relevant for, for some of the metals that we use also in the, in the built environment, um, but not for others. Not yet, at least, we see this being an issue for iron or for aluminium, but for copper, for zinc, for lead, for, for nickel. Um, these uh, lower ore grades are um, an issue. And this means that the impacts per kilogram of produced metal are going up. You can imagine that quite easily. If you want to produce the same amount of metal, you have to crush more and more uh, rocks to, to actually get at it. And that takes energy and that is something that, that uh, yeah, drives um, energy use up and therefore impacts up. Trend number three, efficiency improvements. That is something that of course drives impacts down. The picture here shows um, the improvement in um, energy efficiency um, from 1960 to around now. And then you see that for the production of one kilogram steel, we now need only 40% of the energy that we needed in 1960. This is something that is also expected to continue into the future. Of course, keeping in mind thermodynamic lower levels, but still there's improvements to be made. And this actually drives the impacts down. 
fourth trend, and that is the energy transition. I mentioned already that the energy transition drives the demand for metals up, but it drives the impacts related to metal production down. The pictures here show two scenarios, one called markets first, uh, where the, the energy transition is not very powerful, and the other one is called equitability first, and there the, the energy transition is much more profound. And you see that in, in the equitability first scenario, the greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of metal actually go down. And the more electricity intensive the production of the metal is, the more it goes down. So for aluminium, it, it really goes down to about half of the emissions that, that we have now. And that is um, not even the situation where the energy transition is complete. So there's still fossil fuel, but even um, uh, under these assumptions, the emissions uh, per kilogram aluminium are really considerably going down. For iron, you see that it hardly makes a difference. And that's because uh, iron does not use a lot of electricity. The main greenhouse gas emissions come from the use of uh, cokes in the process. And if you assume that that process stays the same, then also the per kilogram impacts do not change. Um, last one is using recycled materials. That is also mentioned already in the previous uh, uh, presentation. Here you see that this really makes a big difference. If you use recycled materials, the greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram are much, much lower. However, the trend presently in the share of recycled materials is not increasing. You see that in absolute terms, the amount is increasing, but since the total production also increases, the, the share is not really increasing. And that is something that, that hopefully might change if we move towards a more circular economy. So those are the trends and the overall result is that, well, you can expect, depending uh, on the, the state of, of the, or the progression of the energy transition, that the environmental performance per kilogram metal is uh, becoming better. But this is more than counteracted by the increase in demand. So the environmental impacts of metal production at global level will still increase, and not just a little, but a lot. Now, what can be done about this? And then you're, you're looking at specific sectors because yeah, what, what each can do is different. Um, there are some options in general and I very briefly want just to mention them uh, because I would like you later on in the um, in the Miro board session to reflect on that yourself. You know your, your business best, so you know to what extent these things are an option. First is use different. So one of the things that is being discussed now in the um, uh, construction um, uh, circles is, is move towards bio-based construction. The wood impacts related to wood are very much lower than those of metals, and therefore, um, um, yeah, this could be a good idea. Second option is to go for using less. So then we think about efficiency, but we also think about sufficiency in the design. You see lighter design or more efficient design can be uh, an option to reduce those impacts. But uh, there's also a discussion going on about smaller dwellings. So maybe we should move to less space per capita. And this example here, um, a tiny house, um, is something that, that really yeah, um, uh, builds upon that idea. Maybe we should not have those very large dwellings. Maybe we should just reduce it. And then the third one, go circular. So reuse, refurbishing, remanufacturing, also recycling. So um, um, yeah, maybe we can make buildings so that they can be taken apart easier. So uh, via a modular design. 
um, design for recycling, so use materials that can actually be recycled. And then the third one, design for longevity. Uh, maybe if we lengthen the lifespan of buildings, um, yeah, we can also reduce the primary materials input and therefore the connected environmental impact. Um, a life cycle assessment is, is really um, yeah, a very good tool for all those options to assess how effective they are, either in, in reducing resource use or in the impacts related to it. But also, LCA is very important to see what side effects may occur. And those, there are always side effects. So it's something that, that really is very important to, to think about if you consider changes in, in the way you do business uh, with a certain aim in mind, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, have a look at what else may change and what side effects will be. So this is, um, um, yeah, after the break, the, the your assignment for the Miro board. So maybe you can generate ideas on what you as a facade industry actually can do in the area of using different, using less or going circular. And then think not just about how effective it could be, but also um, look at side effects. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Esther. Only one fast question. Uh, what do you think about now the high increase uh, of these bio-based materials? Because, okay, we are now in an European project that is using this type of system, trying to not use steel. And what it becomes in the last year is that uh, it's better probably <laughs> steel materials than these bio-based because the cost increased five or two, six times. So do you think that this is something that uh, is something more uh, from this moment? or we are going to see this type of increase in more in, in, in the long time? Yeah, that is a very uh, good question. Um, I, I don't really know yet. I mean, there's obvious advantages to the use of bio-based materials in the sense that um, the impacts per kilogram of, of produced material are, are much lower um, because they're bio-based. So, so basically, the um, yeah, the, the CO2 uh, emissions, um, it, it does not just emit, it also uh, captures carbon. And um, yeah, there's a lot of debate now of, of how buildings could be actually uh, stores of or storages of carbon so that they can, can um, take carbon out of the atmosphere and, and have it reside there for a very long time. But there are side effects as well to, to this you have to, to be able to produce the wood. And that means you need enormous amounts of, of land that you dedicate purely to, to wood production. Um, and yeah, how, how does that compare? And then I'm reminded a bit uh, of the, the discussion we had around biofuels, where biofuels once upon a time were the salvation of, of, um, of the whole um, uh, climate problem and where it appears that that yeah we cannot scale up that production with so much without a lot of other impacts and without having at least three earths to our availability um, and i haven't seen any calculations on how this would work out at global level for buildings so i i, I don't know yet we have to uh, improve our knowledge in this area Yes, yes. We have in, in, uh, in a meeting this week a member of the European Parliament. And uh, as we are talking about these uh, bio-based materials, they told us that the uh, okay, European Commission now, they don't know uh, if, okay, they know that we don't have any forest in Europe if at the end we change completely the way that we are using the, the product. So at the end, we need to have an equilibrium and uh, probably we cannot go entirely to bio-based components because we don't have any material and we are going to have a lot of problems if you if we do that yeah. so yeah yeah like the ones that we are proposing in this project i think that uh, can also be a complement to this type of things yeah yeah so in the end i think we should not go for just one solution 
it should be a mix of solutions of which biobase can be a part okay 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 so esther thank you very much uh, for your presentation now we have a break uh, so we can come back at uh, 11 uh, five minutes uh, so 10 minutes of break and uh, we can start with a more open session uh, where we can uh, have a more uh, um, dynamical discussion and uh, okay make some exercise that can i think that can be interesting for you so Thank you.